speaking of uh, turns of phrases, I'm going to go off uh, topic here for a minute because as I just wander around YouTube, uh, I often find people whose content I like and then I'll just start watching that. It's very, almost never political content, at least not overtly political. So I'm just going to call a little time out here and go off the rails for a second. First of all, um, uh, what I'm hearing from from um, gamers and especially Star Wars fans who are not political, at least they weren't political a couple years ago, I am finding people who are not in politics in any way cursing, progressives cursing, uh, social justice warriors cursing, this invasive feminism, uh, the left ruining Star Wars and getting into comic books, movies, and, and getting into video games has done something that I didn't think was possible, and that is it has turned a, general, a generation of left-leaning, apathetic people into rock-ribbed conservatives. Hi, we're all good. Thank you. No, we're good. No, no, thank you. No, thank you. Good night. Uh-huh, bye-bye. Um, so uh, that is very, very um, uh, important, very important. But the divergence I wanted to make was, uh, was this, and I'm going to get the exact quote even though it's only three, sen three words, sentence or something. I'm allergic to, what is it, was it retin-A? Uh, here's T. William Shatner, you know, best bad actor that ever lived. Um, this really grabbed me. Uh, so yesterday, I was, uh, I was listening um, uh, to a channel called Jim Can't Swim and um, Retinax. Jim Can't Swim and uh, 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 Retinox A. Yeah. Uh, it's coming through now. Uh, anyway, so I was listening to this guy, and he's a psychologist, and uh, I don't know if he's got a background in interrogation, but basically what he does, oh, you love that channel? I didn't know anybody else had heard of it. Jim Can't Swim. Basically what he does is he takes um, publicly available interrogation tapes of murderers confessing to what they did and breaks it down and analyzes, analyzes the, the strategy of the interrogator and, and analyzes the... Um, the defense patterns and the and the evasions and the strategies of the of the person being interrogated. It's really fascinating. Now this guy did a, a piece on Ted Bundy. He was talking about what he called the death row phenomenon, and that, which in itself is a is is just a just something I'm going to have to talk about. Um, uh, but basically, what he's saying is, and I need to go back and make sure I got this correct because I'm virtually positive this is what he said. But basically what he's saying is, is that um, the U.S. experience with death row used to be that if you were sentenced to death, you'd be executed within a matter of a day or two or sometimes even hours after the verdict. But now, I don't know what the average time is, but it's pretty close to 20 years. It's certainly in excess of 10, I think. And what he was saying is, is that being incarcerated on death row largely consists of solitary confinement and certainly consists of waking up every day, counting how many days you may have left, living in this state of perpetual not just anxiety. I mean, that's the most anxiety you can have, right? Are they going to kill me today? Uh, is it coming tomorrow? Is it going to be next week? Have they set a date? It's an unbelievable mental strain, and and because of the appeals process and so on, we, we put people through it uh, for 15 years, 20 years in some cases. Now, here's what's interesting. Um, I don't, when I hear these people talking about uh, 20 years or 10 years on death row and how stressful it is, my first reaction is, well, was it as stressful as, uh, as the experience uh, that your victim was having when you murdered them? Is it, was, would you go as far as say it's that stressful? That's my first reaction to these kind of things. Um, when I hear people talking about, oh, it's just, you know, this is a just living hell, it's like, no, uh, it's still living. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little more, I'd like to hear the story of, of the person you murdered before I start sending you a whole lot of sympathy. Nevertheless, here's what's interesting about this. He claims, and I suspect he's right, I've seen, it, I've seen this sort of anecdotally in a number of documentaries. It's a really interesting point, a very interesting point. And basically the, the argument goes something like this. The death row effect puts you under such stress 
and gives you so much solitude and so much time to reflect upon the very most important things in life that not in all cases by any means, but in many cases, significantly, statistically significant number of cases, that 5, 10, 15 years on death row so fundamentally changes a person, and not just their personality, actually rewires their brain chemically, so fundamentally changes them that they're no longer the person that committed those crimes. And I actually find that to be not only believable, but compelling. Um, and, and so that puts us in a really strange moral world where the person who we're executing for committing the murder is not the person that committed the murder. Uh, in many cases, they go through, you know, entire uh, periods. They, they reconnect with their family. They find religion. You know, they, um, they feel remorse and guilt and all of this stuff they didn't feel at the time of the crime. So just for the sake of it, I, I happen to think there's something to this. I need to look into it a little more carefully. But if so, it's... Um, it leaves you with some interesting uh, ethical choices. So if you just accept that it happens in some cases, that the person who you end up executing or threaten to execute for 20 years is no longer the same person, um, then it seems to me you have to make a decision. You are either going to have to execute that person within a short period of time, or you're going to have to uh, decide that it, it defaults into a life sentence. And I don't even know if a life sentence is stressful enough to, cri to trigger the death row effect. That's what's so interesting about it. It's almost like in order to burn that toxicity and that murder out of people, you have to scare them to death every single day for 15 or 20 years, and then they actually change. Um, anyway, that's not what I was talking about. That was just uh, something that came up on that. But in, in the death row um, uh, phenomenon video, there's an interview with Ted Bundy. And um, Ted Bundy was interviewed by um, James Dobson, I think, uh, the, the pastor, the Christian evangelist. And here's what's interesting about Ted Bundy. Uh, Ted Bundy is probably the only mass murderer who was intelligent enough and articulate enough to actually explain what it's like to be a... a, a, a serial murderer, rapist, uh, necrophiliac uh, monster. And it's easy to feel sympathy for somebody who's that articulate. I remember when um, they put one of these guys to death in California, the guy's nickname was Football and stuff, and he'd written a, child, uh, written a children's book, so you would, therefore we can't possibly enforce the death penalty, in my thought as well. He murdered three people in cold blood. He, in, in prison, he, he mocked them, begging for their lives, so I say, hey, off the planet, please. But here's, here's all of this just to say this one thing. So Bundy was talking about how he got to be Ted Bundy. And Jim Can't Swim, uh, the, the channel, made the case that Ted Bundy is not, in fact, a psychopath. Uh, he is a, 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 mal a malignant narcissist, malignant to say the least, but he's not a psychopath. And the reason he's not a psychopath is that Ted Bundy was defending his parents. He was saying, my parents had nothing to do with this. I had great parents, lived in a great house. Um, and, and the guy's point was, um, psychopaths don't do that. They don't feel anything for anybody. Bundy was feeling guilty about, um, he didn't want to hurt his, his parents didn't want to hurt any. And, and, and so anyway, he goes on and on and on. And he talked about just how this thing would kind of come over him. And, and, um, and I've had those kind of rages come over me, and um, I've just been more successful in disposing of bodies than, than uh, Bundy, I guess. But seriously, folks, um, but here's what Bundy said. He was saying that what pushed he this is what he was not saying, actually, and this is what I admired about Bundy in this moment and what I thought was so profoundly interesting. Bundy would talk about the effect that pornography had on him, violent pornography especially, and he went to enormous pains to say that the violent pornography did not make him go out and murder people. But he did say, however, when he was challenged on this by uh, Dr. Dobson, he, he did say that this, but this violent pornography was um, the indispensable link. And I wrote that term down, the indispensable link. And that, to me, is absolutely critical. Because to me, that's 
that's exactly the word we need to be using and the expression we need to be using when we talk about these um, school shooters. Uh, when we talk about these school shooters and, um, and either video game violence, violence in movies and television, um, and especially 24-hour fame, none of those things made the person do it. And yet, one of those, at least one, if not all of them, are in fact indispensable links. If you take that away, it doesn't happen. So having it there doesn't cause it, but taking it away stops it. Um, and, uh, and that puts you in a hell of a position, you know? And you, you kind of have to come back, I think, to, okay, well, it, 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 can, it completes the circuit for people who are far, far, far out there on the human fringe. And a lot of people want to say, therefore, we should, we should just destroy the switch and just not let that circuit be closed. We need to ban all these things. But that's punishing the innocent. And, um, and, uh, and then you come back to, yeah, okay, but, you know, nevertheless, it is causing all of this moral decay and all the rest of it. It's a, it's a, it's a thorny issue. Ultimately, I kind of come down to, um, if you have to force somebody to do something, uh, it's probably not a good idea. Um, so uh, that's it. And, and the correlation between fatherlessness and, and mass shooters is the one that really sticks. And again, it's not like the lack of fathers caused these guys to become mass murderers. But at the same time, it was an indispensable link in the process of them becoming mass murderers. And that was a really, really uh, big insight for me. And I have to tell you, uh, Bundy was fighting for his life. He didn't want to die. He was, you know, he, he was using everything he had and he was a smart guy. But I personally judged him to be sincere when he was saying, I just don't want to be misunderstood. It's important that you understand what I'm saying here because this is going to happen again. And the number of times that he specifically stopped himself to interject how emphatically he was saying, I'm not saying that this caused me to be a Ted Bundy. That's the term he used. I'm specifically not saying that pornography caused me, caused me to kill these people. But if I had not been exposed to that violent pornography, I wouldn't have done it. And, and I just find that really, really not just interesting, but important. Important. And I think it's so interesting because there's no immediate uh, um, solution. And, and maybe there isn't a solution. I, I suspect that there isn't. I suspect that this is just the, this is some of the friction heat of the machine and you can oil it as much as you want to and, and eliminate it and that's all great and you should, should try to do that. But nevertheless, um, you know, Gears are going to generate heat. You can get as much of that heat out of there as you can. Good for you. But you can't stop them from generating heat. And so, you know, maybe this is just the price we have to pay. But um, anyway, it was, uh, it was worth me going a little, uh, little uh, tangent on here. Do a couple more, I think, then I'll be on my way. Um,